Good morning. Uh, for many years, I've studied the question of uh, why siblings are so different. And it turns out the answer to this question goes all the way back to the great work by Charles Darwin on the origin of species, published in 1859. And it's exemplified by a group of birds that Darwin collected in the Galapagos Islands that have become uh, iconic for the history of science, namely Darwin's famous finches. Uh, there are 14 species of Darwin's finches. They all evolved from a single ancestor that colonized these islands about two million years ago. And they have evolved into the most extraordinarily different forms. Uh, there is a, a, a huge beaked, uh, sort of gross beak type finch uh, that uh, has a, a beak adapted for crushing very uh, uh, heavy, thick seeds. And then there's this tiny little beak bird, which looks very much like a warbler. And it is, uh, so resembles a warbler that when Darwin collected it, in 1835, he actually thought it was a warbler. He didn't understand it was one of Darwin's finches. And then there's this species that has a long, elongated bill, very much like a meadowlark or a Baltimore oriole, uh, which Darwin mistook for a member of that uh, family, but it's the cactus finch, one of Darwin's finches. There's a, a vegetarian finch that eats the buds of, of uh, flowers and leaves. And then there's this extraordinary form of Darwin's finches uh, called the woodpecker finch, Woodpeckers have a little barb on the end of their tongue and a hollow bill which allows that tongue to dart through and a spear an insect that's in a crevice. Well, the woodpecker finch doesn't have this particular adaptation. And so it has evolved the ability to use twigs or cactus spines to pry the prey out of crevices. And it's one of the world's only uh, tool-using birds. Well, Darwin uh, summed up this, this basic principle under what he called his principle of divergence. And in The Origin of Species, he wrote, uh, the greatest amount of life can be supported by great diversification of structure. So he understood, as, as economists did, that there's a, a, a division of labor and a benefit to the division of labor. And he applied that concept to uh, evolution. And this uh, concept has come to uh, encompass in modern evolutionary biology two basic principles, one of which is called character displacement, and the other is called adaptive radiation. And Darwin's finches are such a famous case because they exemplify these two basic principles. Uh, character displacement is, is uh, uh, the, uh, the instance of uh, two species coming together and pushing each other into different uh, ecological niches. And one of the first documented cases of this was, in fact, uh, with Darwin's finches. There's a, uh, uh, w when you see these uh, two species, the small and the medium ground finch, and they're on the same island, they push each other apart. But there's an interesting sort of a natural experiment in Galapagos, which is a, a very small island indicated here, Daphne Island, where Peter and Rosemary Grant do most of their award-winning research. And only one of those two species is found on that particular island. And its beak structure is exactly intermediate between the two forms that you see when they're together on the same island. And there's another island in Galapagos that only has the other species. And again, the bill form has converged on uh, an intermediate uh, condition. So we call this character release, and then the opposite is called character displacement. Well, when you allow this process to go on for two million years with new species evolving on different islands, you get uh, not only character displacement, but eventually you get adaptive radiation of uh, uh, increasingly large number of species into different ecological niches. Well, why are siblings so different? Well, they're really just like Darwin's finches. They're uh, like species, they, siblings compete, and competition, uh, as with Darwin's finches, leads to divergence. Well, why did Darwinian siblings compete? Well, cartoonists and poets sometimes see things in advance of scientists, and Gary Larson uh, expressed it as well as anyone could <laughs> with this cartoon. No, really, Mom, who do you like best? Well, s siblings compete over parental investment. That's what sibling rivalry is all about. Siblings want all the goodies that parents uh, control, whether it's uh, gifts or money or love. Siblings are after that, and they're competing with each other for those goodies. And we know from the animal biology literature that sibling competition can be very intense indeed. Among uh, piglets, for example, the very first piglet to be born heads immediately for the anterior most teat of the mother because it's the richest in milk supply. And that uh, piglet will defend that teat 
uh, literally to the death, and these uh, piglets are born with little eye teeth that drop out later, and the eye teeth, the only function of these eye teeth is to do battle with their fellow piglets immediately after birth for the possession of the most favorable teeth. And the consequence of this is that uh, those piglets that are born uh, later, and they're, they're all born within a few minutes of each other, uh, have about 50% higher mortality because the milk supply is lower in those posterior teeth. So this is, uh, at least for piglets, a serious business. Uh, there are many uh, species of birds in which siblicide, the killing of one sibling by another, uh, is part of the evolved uh, strategies of the species. Uh, and an example of this is uh, Egyptian or North African black eagles, where siblicide occurs about 98% of the time. And, and the, you know, the older sibling basically pecks the younger sibling to death within uh, two or three days after hatching. And you have to sort of wonder, what's, what's the point of even having a second egg if the, if the first one's just going to do away with the second one? And the answer to that question is, it, it actually is adaptive. The cost of the egg is very low. And in case a predator does away with number one, you don't have to go through the whole mating process all over again. You have the spare uh, there ready to sort of uh, take over. You know, in, in England, they call uh, William and Harry the heir and the spare. And <laughs> it's really the same principle. <laughs> Believe it or not, there is even sibling competition among plants. Uh, this plant is the uh, Indian black plum. And it has seeds that have 24 or 25 ovules. The very first ovule to be fertilized secretes a death chemical, which kills off the other 24 ovules by preventing them from metabolizing sucrose. Well, wh what's going on here? Well, basically, uh, if you had 24 siblings all growing up around you, they would shade each other. And so the, the siblings are in competition, and the very first sibling, they've all evolved this strategy of basically killing, killing each other off. So plants have sibling rivalry. Well, sibling divergence is not a random process. Uh, there are many things that shape it. One of the things that we understand best about sibling divergence is the role that birth order plays in that process. Uh, birth order shapes family niches, just as uh, uh, differences in ecology shape the, the niches that species occupy. And it leads to adaptive sibling strategies. And we can summarize these adaptive strategies fairly simply under five basic personality dimensions. It turns out if you analyze every personality test on Earth in every possible language, they're really only telling you sort of five basic things. And those five things are attributes that relate to conscientiousness, uh, to agreeableness, to extroversion, uh, to what's called openness to experience, and finally, neuroticism or anxiety-related traits. And we know from uh, from sibling differences that uh, birth order leads to uh, differentiation along these five dimensions. For example, conscientiousness is very much related to the role of surrogate parenting that firstborns uh, often tend to, uh, 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 to engage in. So firstborns typically are more, uh, more parent-oriented. They tend to uh, help parents in child-rearing tasks. They're the sort of responsible sibling uh, in some cases, the goody two-shoes of the family from the perspective of their younger siblings. And so they're higher in conscientiousness, and that has a lot of uh, interesting benefits. Uh, they do their homework, they get higher grades at school, they're more likely to go to Harvard, Yale, and Princeton and get into the best universities. Uh, there are differences in agreeableness, but here younger siblings tend to score higher. And that has to do with the fact that if you're big and strong and, and uh, dominant over your younger siblings, you don't have to be as agreeable as you do when you're, you lack that power. Uh, there was just a study that came out uh, in the journal Animal Behavior. It's, I think, one of the first times they've ever done a paper on humans and involved one of these economic investment games. And the authors showed that younger siblings were much more likely to uh, re remunerate the player in the game with uh, additional funds than the firstborns were in the sample. So they were more altruistic and also more willing to take uh, risks. Finally, uh, in addition, there are differences in what we call extroversion or uh, sort of uh, boldness uh, versus timidity. And uh, these actually split in two interesting ways by birth order. Firstborns tend to uh, adopt roles of leadership. They're more assertive. Uh, that relates a little bit to dominance. But younger siblings are definitely more sociable. And sociability is kind of a, it's a low power strategy that younger siblings uh, cultivate. 
Uh, there are differences in what psychologists call openness to experience. And I like to view openness to experience as a sort of a dimension by which, as a younger sibling, you find your niche. In many ways, uh, when the younger sibling arrives in the family, it's like arriving a, 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 in a monopoly game where the elder sibling has already bought uh, Boardwalk and Park Place and has got hotels there, and they're just waiting for you to land on their, <laughs> on their spot on the board, their, your, their niche on the board, to wipe you out. And so younger siblings are sort of sitting there thinking, well, wh what can I do? What can I offer my parents that will be uh, a little bit uh, attractive to get, get some more investment, get some money from my own hotels? You know, so they buy Marvin Gardens, which isn't very valuable, but they hope that they pyramid that into something more important. And so younger siblings are always looking for ways to find a more unconventional niche, an open niche, something that hasn't been taken. Uh, firstborns, on the other hand, tend to be more open to experience in a rather limited sense of intellectuality, and that relates in part to uh, they're doing well at school and so forth, so they, um, uh, they tend to uh, uh, read the New York Review of Books and things of that sort. And finally, on neuroticism, we find uh, very minimal birth order differences, and that makes quite a lot of sense because neuroticism per se isn't particularly adaptive, uh, although it can be in, in certain clever ways. Um, and, uh, and so most sibling differences uh, due to uh, uh, competition in the family are all about adapting to family niches, and so the, the differences on the other four dimensions are larger. Well, if we look at the birth order literature as a whole for the last 40 or 50 years, there are uh, literally over a thousand studies, and we sort of sum them all up uh, using what, what uh, uh, statisticians call meta-analysis, we get a very clear picture of firstborns indeed being more conscientious uh, than laterborns, laterborns being somewhat more agreeable, more, uh, more extroverted in the sense of being sociable, uh, more open to experience in the sense of being unconventional, untraditional, sometimes rebellious, and finally, very minimal differences on uh, neuroticism. Uh, other significant birth order differences in, uh, stem from uh, the fact that firstborns tend to get more parental investment. And as a consequence, firstborns have higher IQs than laterborns. There was a study that came out a couple years ago involving uh, virtually every single child ever born in Norway. And they had from military and other records the IQs of every single child and the firstborns had about three more IQ points than their younger siblings. Uh, firstborns are also overrepresented in most measures of eliteness, for example, who's who, they win more Nobel Prizes than their younger siblings, uh, but not the Nobel Peace Prize. <laughs> younger siblings are overrepresented in that category. And because laterborns uh, receive less parental investment, they're more inclined to take risks and to question the status quo. You know, when, when uh, you don't get much investment from parents and your, your likelihood of actually surviving childhood is low, the cost of risk taking is lower. And so it actually pays to take risks. And we know from uh, numerous studies that have been done around the world, uh, 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 younger siblings actually have higher mortality than older siblings. You know, uh, parents have the first child, they're worried about every little thing that can possibly happen, they vaccinate the child for every possible disease. After they've had a couple and they realize you can drop them and they actually don't break, <laughs> uh, parents sort of get lazy. They stop vaccinating their kids and they invest less in the younger siblings. And as a result, uh, younger siblings have about 50% a higher mortality rate in uh, less developed countries. And a study was even done in the 20th century in Europe showing that younger siblings have about 33% higher mortality rate than older siblings do, particularly in the early years of childhood. So getting out of childhood is a serious, risky business, even in modern life, and younger siblings are less likely to do so, so they're more inclined to take certain kinds of risks to uh, impress their parents in some way and get a little bit of extra parental investment. Well, I just uh, finished a study with a, a collaborator where we tried to test this uh, idea by looking at participation in dangerous sports. Uh, dangerous sports are pretty much defined as all the sports where you can lose your teeth. So <laughs> that included uh, rugby and uh, uh, American football, well, even soccer, uh, but, but also uh, categorized among dangerous sports were things like skydiving and bungee jumping and parachute, you know, well, skydiving is parachute jumping. Um, all racing cars and, and bobsled racing and so forth. 
And we did a meta-analysis of all known previous studies on this subject, and we found that younger siblings were 50% more likely to engage in all of these uh, high-risk sports. So we had the idea that we would look at a, a, at a particular sport and see whether we could find some differences in different sorts of behaviors within the same sport. And we chose American baseball. Uh, American baseball is a wonderful thing because statisticians have been collecting baseball statistics for almost a, a century and a half. And there are literally millions of statistics on baseball players. And it also turns out that 700 brothers have all played in the major leagues together. So these are people like uh, uh, Joe DiMaggio and his two brothers, Vin and Dom, all played in the major leagues. So we looked at these 700 brothers and we were particularly interested to see uh, who engages in high-risk behaviors in baseball. And the highest risk behavior you can find in baseball is base stealing. It actually has a very low marginal utility. Most base stealing among less talented players is actually not a good idea because you get caught out and then there's an extra out on your team and you're not on base to be driven home. So you have to be very good at it for it to pay off. And base stealing also has one of the highest in injury rates in baseball. So we expected that younger siblings would be more inclined to steal bases. And we were, we, indeed we found that, and we were extraordinarily surprised by the size of the effect. Uh, among these brothers, younger siblings were approximately 10 times more likely to steal bases compared to their elder siblings. And one of the most interesting things about this particular finding is the fact that it was confined to those brothers who either played in the same position. So for example, if one brother was a, uh, a, a batter and a field player and the other brother was a pitcher, then the younger brother didn't feel compelled to steal uh, or try to steal more bases. And it was also uh, found most intensely among brothers who were close in age. So it was a, an exemplification of ongoing sibling competition. The younger brothers were trying to use base stealing as a way of competing with their own elder siblings. Uh, we also found younger siblings were more likely to be hit by pitches, and that's because they, they get in there and crowd the plate. They're not going to be intimidated by that pitcher that's trying to brush them back and, and uh, keep them from protecting that strike zone. And finally, they, uh, they tended to hit more home runs, but at the cost of having less accuracy. So they're going for the long ball, but of course when you try to hit the hell out of the ball all the time, you, uh, you, miss, you strike out more. So they were definitely engaged in various high-risk activities. Um, I wrote a book called Born to Rebel, which was a survey of uh, more than 100 different historical events in Western history. And I was looking to see whether younger siblings would be more likely to support radical revolutions of any kind. And I uh, reviewed a, a large number of revolutions in the history of science, including the Darwinian Revolution. And it turns out that for about 150 years before Darwin published The Origin of Species, younger siblings were consistently more likely to support various theories of evolution at a time when not a single firstborn voiced support for those theories. Darwin himself was the fifth of six uh, siblings. Alfred Russell Wallace, who co-discovered the theory of natural selection, was also the fifth of six siblings. And most of their supporters were uh, younger siblings. And the, all of these statistics are corrected for the fact that, yes, there are more younger siblings in the population. But when you control for that, younger siblings liked this radical innovation. And if we look at uh, history in general, we find that laterborns corrected for their expected numbers in these groups were overrepresented in things like the Protestant Reformation by almost five to one compared to firstborns. Uh, in a survey I did of more than 30 revolutions in, po in politics, including the French Revolution, the Russian Revolution, uh, they're about three times more likely to support these theories. Uh, in revolutions in science, they're about twice as likely to support, but there's a, a, a very strong exception here. The more technical the revolution was, uh, for example, Newtonian theory or Einstein's theory of, uh, of relativity, the more likely firstborns were to innovate in those areas. So when the theory was something the Pope hated, laterborns loved it. <laughs> but when the theory was something the Pope couldn't understand, <laughs> then firstborns had a shot. And, and that's because firstborns are very good at, at puzzle solving, and they, that's why they win more Nobel Prizes. Uh, now, if you're thinking as a, uh, 
as a firstborn in the audience, gee, laterborns have all the fun. You, you should also appreciate that, that younger siblings support failed revolutions. They love phrenology and mesmerism. They can't, they can't differentiate between junk sometimes and <laughs> the real thing. So let me just sum up by saying that Darwin really understood the problem of siblings, although he didn't talk about it uh, very much. Uh, diversification among siblings is all about family niches, just as diversification in biology is all about ecological niches. Thank you. Thank you.